Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our worship service this afternoon. It's so great to see so many smiling faces again today. And we look forward to worshiping together, and we pray that the Lord will be with us this afternoon and give us a spirit, and that we all may be strengthened through the preaching of his word, and that also we may share in our songs of thanksgiving to him as well. Our pre-service song this afternoon is Amazing Grace, and after singing this, we'll welcome Pastor John to the pulpit, and we pray that the Lord will also give him the strength and courage to preach his word as well. rise and begin our worship. Congregation from where comes our help? Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive now God's greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us respond by Singing together his praises, let us sing from Psalm 33, the stanzas 1 and 2.
Let us now come before God in prayer. Lord God, triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what a joy, what a blessing it is to come into your presence, giving you praise and glory. You're worthy of all praise and glory and adoration. Yes, we praise you for all your great works. You could just sing about one of those great works. Oh, Father, the work of creating all things, the heavens and the earth and everything in them. And we praise you for what beauty, what splendor, what wisdom you display in all of this. And we praise you, O Father, for your work of providence, that not only have you created all things, but you uphold all things. You have the whole world in your hands. And we praise you, O Son. Yes, you are the one who has redeemed us. You are the one who came into this world, who assumed our flesh and blood, carried out your earthly ministry, even unto the point of death on the cross. And you're the one who also rose triumphant and victorious. You're the one who has ascended on high. You are the one who rules. And so, Father, you do rule through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and we pray that your Son will continue to live and work in us. And we praise you, Holy Spirit. It is through you that we have received the word. You're the one who has inspired the writers. And so we have the full and complete message of salvation. And you are the one who works with the word. And we pray that you would also work in us this afternoon, that you would work in us a true and living faith, that you would strengthen us in faith, that we may through you be directed to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we may be directed to the hope of the gospel that he gives. And we pray that you, Holy Spirit, may dwell in us and lead us in this new week in the way of faith, in the way of obedience, also in the way of obedience to the seventh commandment, which will be the focus of our attention this afternoon. We thank you, O Father, for your commands. We have the ten words of the covenant they are our rule for a life of gratitude. And yet we realize that we need the illumination of your spirit to understand how we need to live in a way which is pleasing to you. And we need to be filled with the spirit so that we may live the new life in the power, indeed, of the spirit. We pray, will you so bless us then as we pay attention to the the seventh commandment, bless the reading of your word. Bless the teaching and preaching of your word. And that we may be encouraged also with respect to our sexuality. To go in the way of holiness, of sanctification. And that we may live in all ways to the praise of your glory. And so be with us in this time of worship. Will you keep all distraction far from us and hear us in our Savior's name. Amen. Let us now take our Bibles and let us turn to the New Testament. Our scripture reading this afternoon comes from two passages in the New Testament. First, from the Gospel according to Mark, Mark chapter 10. We're going to read the first nine verses, and then we will turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians, reading from chapter 3, the verses, or chapter 5, the verses 1 through 5. Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, hear then the word of our God. And he, that is Jesus, left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and get crowds gathered to him again. And again, as was his custom, he taught them. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, What did Moses command you? 
And they said Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What? Therefore, God has joined together. Let not man separate. And so far from Mark chapter 10, then turning to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, so Ephesians 5, and we will read the first five verses of this passage. And there we read as follows, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And so far, our scripture reading. Let us now sing from Psalm 51, the stanzas 3, 4, and 5. <laughs>
brothers and sisters, this afternoon we will pay attention to the Seventh Commandment and the summary teaching of the Seventh Commandment as we find it in the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 51. And let us read together then these two questions and answers. What does the Seventh Commandment teach us? That all unchastity is cursed by God. We must therefore detest it from the heart and live chaste and disciplined lives both within and outside of holy marriage. Does God in this commandment forbid nothing more than adultery and similar shameful sins? Since we, body and soul, are temples of the Holy Spirit, it is God's will that we keep ourselves pure and holy. And therefore, he forbids all unchaste acts, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever may entice us to unchastity. And so far the catechism, after the teaching of God's word, let us respond in song, singing together from hymn 50, the stanzas 2, 3, and 4. Beloved in our Lord and Savior, everything seems to be permissible these days, especially when it comes to sexuality. Let us not kid ourselves. There are very few boundaries left. We're facing a continuing meltdown of our moral order also with respect to gender and sexuality. When people turn against the Lord and revolt, and that's what we are seeing in our culture, this is what happens. Who would have heard about transgenderism 20 years ago? Now we live in a world where a judge in B.C. determined that a father who refused to refer to his daughter as a boy and his effort to oppose her transition constituted family violence. This father had gone to court to stop his 15-year-old daughter from undergoing hormone injections, arguing that she lacked the maturity to understand radical and long-term consequences of such injections. He also argued that she had been unduly influenced by transgender activists. Yes, how have we come to the situation where a father can be threatened with arrest and even jail time for the crime of addressing his daughter as she instead of her preferred he? And so today there has been said that we have many different genders. We have supposedly gone from two genders, binary genders, male and female, to more than 60 different genders. And the question is, which box do you check when filling out forms? And there's now a non-binary box. And thus we have gender-neutral pronouns, they and them being actually introduced into daily conversation at work and school and elsewhere. And this raises all kinds of questions and confusion for, for what is non-binary. And how can one person be called they? And what if you gen identify as a gender, having an absence of gender? And what if you're gender fluid, moving between genders? And what about those who are pangender, or two-spirited, or gender queer? This is a sexual revolution which is completely out of control, so much for just being male or female. And if this is not enough, we recently had the conversion therapy bill quickly pass through the House of Commons and the full impact of this legislation for pastors like Darren and myself and the families of loved ones struggling with, with same-sex desires is not known. 
And so we see a great deal of confusion and chaos being sown on, on issues of gender and sexuality. And sadly, this confusion and chaos is not just out there in the world. This also has affected us as believers, as church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Indeed, there are those among us, also our own family members, who, who struggle with transgenderism, struggle with same-sex attraction. And don't we all, don't we all as sinful human beings, whether we're single or married, yes, struggle with respect to our sexuality, struggle with impure sexual acts and gestures and words and thoughts and desires? Yes, how many will admit to struggles with pornography on our phones, on our tablets, and laptops? After all, we're living in a world which is also inundated with pornography and then I haven't even mentioned adultery within marriage, living together and having sex before marriage, or having friends with benefits, and then even such things as sexual abuse and incest. And that's why this afternoon, let us turn to the Word of God. Let us seek to anchor our lives in the truth of the gospel, in the truth of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to what he commands also with respect to the seventh commandment. Let us look to our Lord God, look to our Savior Jesus Christ, to the washing with his blood, with his spirit. Let us come to truly know his abundant grace, know of the forgiveness that he offers, know of the renewing work of the spirit in our hearts and lives, then all with respect to our gender and our sexuality. And let us in this way, each one of us, and be encouraged by the word this afternoon. Encouraged to live chaste and, and disciplined lives both within and outside of holy marriage. And so let's hear God's word this afternoon summarized in this way. Amid sexual chaos, the Lord calls us to chaste living. And we'll see that the Lord created male and female and that he lives in us by the Spirit. Yes, when it comes to knowing the truth about the seventh commandment, about our sexuality, our gender, we need to go back to the beginning, to God's great work of creation. This is where all the commandments, including the seventh commandment, is rooted in the perfect work of God, our Father, the Creator. When God created mankind in the very beginning, He made us, as we can read in His image. And you read that in Genesis 1. He said, let us make man in our own image. And that's what God did. And as we're also told there in, in Genesis, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Yes, male and female. Yes, this is how our Father perfectly made mankind. In, in two sexes, in two genders. Put it in another way, a binary mode, male and female. And then the creator pronounced that this distinction of male and female, like everything else that he had created, was, was very good. That's everyone of us as human beings are either male our female in our biology, in our creation. Now, if we would look at, you could say, the second account of God's work of creation, you look in chapter 2 of Genesis, you get a fuller description of the creation of mankind as male and female. Here you see that Adam was made first, man was made first and then God observed that it was not good for man to be alone and he said I will make a helper suitable for him he would make a helper that would complement him and then what the Lord God did was take a rib from the man and he and out of that rib he created a woman and then he brought the woman to the man and there we have the first marriage and there at that first marriage, in that wedding, Adam sang a beautiful song about his, his bride, his wife. He said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. 
and speaks of the close unity between man and woman. And then it's also added there, those well-known words, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. And so it's very clear that it is God, our Father, who not only created us male and female, but he's also the one who established marriage. Marriage is not a a man-made institution. No, it is a God-given institution. It is union of not one man with another man or one woman with another woman, but of one man and one woman. Now, we might be thinking, well, that's the Old Testament. What it says there about male and female, what it says about marriage, that's passe, that's old-fashioned, like get with the program. And yet, what do we read in In Mark 10, what did our Lord Jesus Christ say there in that New Testament gospel? Well, as you read, he was speaking there to the Pharisees and been wondering about, was it lawful to divorce one's wife? And then he directed them back to the very beginning. He directed them back to creation. You see, Jesus Christ did not reject what happened there at creation. He did not reject that creation ordinance no, not at all. In fact, he, he quoted from the Old Testament scriptures. He quoted from Genesis 1 and chapter 2. And he said, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. That's Genesis 1. And then from, from Genesis 2, he said, and therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And so you see the Lord Jesus reaffirms that each human being comes to this world already defined by the Lord God as male or female and nothing else. As the psalmist says in Psalm 139 of of the Lord God, you form my inward parts, my inmost self, my mind and heart. And it can also be said, he also formed you and me, in our chromosomes, in our DNA. And he did this most wonderfully, wonderfully, yes, as male or female. And so our sexual identity, our gender, is not a, a human choice, but a divinely determined reality for each and every one of us. You hear people, you even hear parents speak of letting their children choose their sex, their gender identity. But God's word tells us differently. Whatever a person feels, be it fleetingly or more enduringly, cannot trump what God our Father has made of each one of us being either male or female. Indeed, our Father created each one of us either male or female. While we as males and females have practically the same set of 20,000 genes, the only physical difference is our genetic makeup, and that's our sexual chromosomes. People want to change their gender. They may have hormone replacement therapy. They may have surgery to remove body parts. Yet genetically and essentially, we remain as God created us, either male or female. And not only did God, our God, our Father, create us, each one of us, either male or female, He has also created us so that when we become teens, we also see a growing up and a maturing physically and sexually speaking. And then we see awakening within us, yes, this sexual desire, this sexual attraction. We have this desire, this attraction and growing for the opposite sex. And this too, this too is a good gift from God, our Father, the Creator. And therefore, as teens, you, you don't need to be ashamed. You do not need to feel guilty for the feelings and the desires that God, our Father himself, created in each one of us. Yet remember, God created these sexual desires sexual attractions for for a purpose 
Our sexual desires and attractions, they need to be used responsibly. They need to be used obediently to God's revealed will. So this good gift of, of sexual desire for the opposite sex is, is, you could say, God's way of leading us to courtship, to marriage, in the bond of love. So there is indeed a place for, for young guys seeking out a girlfriend, young ladies seeking out a boyfriend. Just think of that blossoming, yes, relationship of love we, we have described for us in the Old Testament book of the Song of Songs, or also known as the Song of Solomon. You read that book, it's a beautiful book in the Bible. It speaks of a deepening love of a young couple with, you know, they have for each other and that, that leads to marriage. Where they're fully committed to each other, where they may give themselves fully to each other in the, even in the most intimate way with respect to their sexuality within the bonds of marriage. And so marriage is, is not a form of man-made bondage, as some feminists suggest, but it's a, it's a God-ordained institution established in the beginning of creation, and a marriage as established by God, you can say, is a covenant, a covenant between husband and wife, a covenant which requires total commitment of love from, from both husband and wife for each other, and they basically commit themselves totally to the other. I am yours and yours is mine. You can always depend on me, and I will always love you, so help me God. That's what marriage is all about. And yes, in this in this bond of marriage, yes, then God made the bodies of males and females for each other. Indeed, on the level of biology, physiology, anatomy, and, and even biochemistry, males and females, yes, they correspond, they complement each other. That's the way, yes, human sexual and reproductive system is designed by our, our creator. Any other sexual relationship contradicts that, that design of our God. It's no wonder that in the New Testament, and it says that same-sex activity dishonors the body. You read that in Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Therefore, it says, God gave them up to the dishonoring of their bodies. Now it's widely assumed today that people are driven primarily by their sexual desires and feelings and attractions. These are the things that make you who you are, and that's your identity. It's all about sexuality. But instead of focusing on our sinful sexual feelings and desires, let acknowledge what we already are. Having a male or a female body is a good gift from God, our Father, the Creator. And this body which He has given us is for our good. Let's not downplay our body being either male or female, as you hear some activists do, and merely define ourselves by our sexual feelings and desires. Now we also know what happened not much after God created this beautiful world? There came the fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And with this revolt, with this rebellion against the Lord God, everything, yes, everything was spoiled. It was corrupted. It was tainted by sin, including our sexuality. Gone was that wholesome and pure sexual desire and relations of our first parents and, and for that matter of all their descendants, including you and me. And so we today, whether we're male or female, whether we're married or single, in one way or another, we usually sin against the seventh commandment. We fall short in so many ways. And we're not helped by the world around us. We live in a world which is awash with sexual immorality and perversion. The world we live in today really is not much different from the Canaanite world which the Israelites came up against as they entered into the promised land. And what we know of the Canaanite world, it was a world of unchecked, impure sexual desires. 
anything went, sexually speaking. That's why God gave very clear commands to his people as they were about to enter the promised land of Canaan. They were not to follow in the way of of the previous inhabitants, their sexually perverse ways. And that's why in, in a passage like Leviticus 18, God spells out very clearly why, say, sexual relations within family is strictly forbidden. Very clear commands against incest, but also clear commands against same sexual activity, against sexual relations with animals. For back then in the Canaanite culture, yes, many were caught up in homosexuality and bestiality and incest and prostitution and adultery. And today we see the same as our, as our world turns its back on the Lord and His rule. They get caught up in a sexual revolution has destroyed all the boundaries around. And so what we see is that this command of God, the seventh command is the most ridiculed of all God's commands. Just look at the movies, look at the TV shows of today where having sex before marriage is applauded, where the gay lifestyle is promoted, where transgenderism is a given. Or bestiality is seen as avant-garde. Never before has so much sexual deviance been made to look so normal. And then there's there's more. What about pornography? I mentioned it earlier. Our culture is awash in pornography. It's not just on the buses and the shelters. It's only a click away on the internet. Pornography, sex-related sites, they make up 60% of daily web traffic. 70% of men aged 18 to 34 view a porn site at least once a month. And among children 8 through 16 with internet access, 90% have viewed porn online. And the average age of exposure, as I read, was 11. And see, the seventh commandment is not just being broken, it's being pulverized. And what about ourselves? None of us, whether we're married or single, are immune from committing sexual immorality. There are those who are single, who who struggle, yes, with same-sex attraction, and struggle to remain pure before marriage, struggle to speak and dress in a modest and a pure way. But also those within marriage, yes, struggle to remain sexually pure within this bond. Just because one is married, The battle against sexual immorality doesn't end. Struggle, yes, a real struggle to live chaste and disciplined lives both within and outside of holy marriage. How often don't we fall short in keeping this command? How often don't we transgress this command in one way or another, not just with our, with our thoughts and, but also with our words? What about those crude sexual jokes? And yes, what's happening inside? What doesn't come out of our mouths? What does not come out in actions? What's going on here in our minds, in our hearts, when it, when it comes to this commandment? And you can see how such sin, yes, has ruined our life in the most deep and intimate way. And yes, we do live in a world which has made a cult out of our desires, also our sinful sexual desires. And many see their sexual identity and sexual expression as, as entirely personal. If someone has homosexual desires, we're made to feel we can never question them. And so the new law prohibiting conversion therapy. And similarly, if someone has sexual feelings that don't align with their physical body supposedly the only thing to do is accept this and what this person is experiencing and so if i feel myself to be a 30 year old female and want to dress as one who are you to say that i'm wrong let's think that through for a moment what if some 65 year old male 
claims he feels he's sexually attracted to young children and then adds, and who are you to say that I'm wrong? You see, all the boundaries are disappearing. Anything goes. Now, some, yes, some people do suffer from what they call gender dysphoria, confusion. We need to acknowledge this. No one knows why gender dysphoria happens, and then sometimes quite suddenly. But we can see it is the result of the fall into sin. And what they experience is not necessarily reflective of willful disobedience to God's commands. But it is a symptom of the fall of sin and the brokenness of this world. And those, yes, then, who suffer with with transgender feelings, we need to have compassion on them, but we do not need to endorse such things as hormone therapy or surgery or, or cross-dressing. Instead, to we need to remember how God our Father created us. We need to know of His creative design, His perfect design, yes, of male and female. And we also need to remember our Lord Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us. Who doesn't leave us in confusion and chaos, but who is recreating us by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Indeed, we need to look to the Lord Jesus. He knew what God said there in the very beginning. In creating mankind male and female. Jesus himself, he too was created in God's image. He was created male. And that way, Jesus was truly one of us in every respect, even with respect to his gender, his sexuality. He too had sexual desires. He too had to deal with sexual temptations. They were all around him. After all, he even lived in a world which was not much different from, from ours. A world of unprecedented sexual immorality. And yet throughout his entire life on earth, Jesus was truly and fully obedient to his Father's will. Also, the seventh commandment. And this is the obedience of Jesus Christ, which is ours. That we can rightfully lay claim to. And just look at what happened there at the end of his life. Our Lord Jesus Christ was stripped of all of his clothes, and there he hung naked on the cross, there in public. What shame our Lord Jesus endured there on the cross for us, for, for us, the church. There he shed his blood, his own precious blood, for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. In this way, he fully paid for all our sins, also our sins against the seventh commandment. What a great sacrifice he made there on the cross, giving, yes, complete atonement for our sins and having bought us with his blood. Yes, we truly belong to the Lord Jesus. As as we know from the well-known hymn, the church is one foundation. From heaven he came and sought us to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought us, and for her life he died. You see what Jesus did? What you see there with his suffering and death is a picture of marriage. You get there a picture of the gospel. For remember, the Bible is a love story from start to finish. It's a story about God as a, as a lover who seeks his bride, the church, and rescues her. Each marriage with the love of husband and wife for each other is meant to reflect that great love story. Thus our being male and female is not meaningless, it's not oppressive, but it's a reflection of the history of of redemption, of salvation in Jesus Christ. Yes, Christ is the groom. We are the bride. He laid down his life for us. With his 
With his blood he bought us. With his blood he fully paid for all our sins. With his blood all our sins are forgiven. We need to embrace in faith our Lord Jesus Christ. Look to him. Look to him also when it comes to the seventh commandment, when it comes to obeying this command. Let us live each day by faith in our crucified and resurrected Lord and Savior. Let's not find our identity in our in our sexual feelings, which are sinful feelings, but in Jesus Christ, in our union with him. As he abides in us and we in him, that is crucial. And that way we fully and completely belong to him. And we belong to him not just in our souls, but also in our bodies. Let's not dismiss our bodies. That's what we see happening in this world. Body, what's your body? Do whatever you want with your body. Let's not treat this God's given biological sex of our bodies with suspicion and disdain as we see in the world around us. But remember, this is how God has so wonderfully made us. And that has encouraged those among us who then struggle, yes, struggle with transgender and homosexual feelings, to live as we all should live, live by faith in Jesus Christ, in dependence completely upon him, finding in him our true identity, is believe in Jesus Christ, and so receive the complete forgiveness of all your sins, also our sins against the seventh commandment. So easily we can be entrapped by these sins, and we can easily despair These sins, they bring us a lot of shame and loneliness. And who wants to acknowledge them? Yet let us come to our God and acknowledge them before him and know of his grace in Jesus Christ. Know of the blood of his son that washes away all these sins, no matter how vile and filthy they make us feel. Remember, we have been baptized baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Remember, he, as water washes away dirt from our bodies, so his blood washes away all our sins. And so we are freed from our sins, also our sexual sins, and we stand right before our Father. What a great redemption we have in our Lord and Savior. That's the good news that we need to hold on to. And then we need to also heed the words as we read them there in Ephesians 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And so, yes, let's follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, our Lord and Master. Let us walk by the Spirit each and every day, as you can read in Galatians 5. And so, yes, in view of God's mercy as shown to us in Jesus Christ, then we present our bodies as living sacrifices of thankfulness, holy and pleasing to our God. Is by the power of the Holy Spirit we present our bodies, our male and female bodies, as such living sacrifices to him. For Jesus Christ is concerned for us, whether we're single or married, of having us live as pure and chaste and disciplined lives with respect to our bodies. It's not just our souls, but our bodies. That Jesus lays claim on. And thanks to Jesus Christ, then, we may in our bodies also then be temples of of the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of all holiness, of sanctity and purity, dwells within us. And therefore, then we can go forward. Then we can take to heart the command as we find it there in Ephesians 5. It's so important command But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. That's the command that comes to us. 
to act as saints, as holy ones, as pure ones. And then also with respect to our sexuality, there's not even to be a hint of sexual immorality among us, as it says here. This is where we indeed require radical surgery. Radical surgery, not on our bodies, but on our souls, on our spirits. When it comes to the seventh commandment, indeed, we need to take decisive action when it comes to removing all unchaste acts, gestures, thir- thoughts, desires, and whatever may entice us to unchastity. Radical action. We may even have to involve those around us. We may need accountability when it comes to this command. For we all have our struggles. For the single young or older male, may be porn on the Eiffel. For another, it may be loneliness and same-sex attraction. For another, it's crude joking and filthy talk. And when we're young and we struggle with transgender feelings, let's not panic. Many teens do struggle with temporary gender dysphoria. Growing up, sexually speaking, it's not easy. We suddenly have these strong desires, these strong sexual desires, and they're so easily corrupted by, by sin. And as young people, we go through tremendous stresses and strains as we adjust to our changing bodies, our emerging sexual desires. Yet let us, let us not condone cross-dressing or hormone therapy or surgery as the solution to sometimes very confused feelings and desires. When there's a disconnect between our God-given sex, be it male or female, and our sexual desires, the solution is not to change our bodies. Rather, what we need to seek is the changing of our minds. Pray that the Spirit may change us from within, that the Spirit may transform us, transform our minds. We need the grace and Spirit of Jesus Christ to be at work in us. And in this way, the old ways of thinking and feeling give way to the new ways of thinking and feeling. This is the way the power of the gospel shows itself in our daily lives. Remember, what defines us is not our sexual feelings and desires, but, but Jesus Christ. Defined by our relationship to Him. We are to live by the power and grace which is promised to those who are engrafted to him, who are in Christ, as we heard this morning. Living in that Christ-conforming way isn't easy. It's a process which takes much time, much effort. It calls each one of us, yes, to radical self-denial, daily self-denial. This is true for every one of us as believers, called to deny ourselves. Not just those who struggle with transgender feelings, same-sex attraction, but also those who are filled with sexual lust for someone of the opposite sex. And this way, this command speaks to all of us. And yes, such radical self-denial doesn't mean cut off body parts, but it may mean controlling and cutting off our access to the World Wide Web. It may mean staying clear of certain places and people. And biologically speaking, we don't have a girl trapped in a boy's body. We're not trapped by biology. But we're more likely to be trapped by the depravity of sin. And only it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that can begin to resolve such issues such tensions in our broken lives. We need the transforming power of the gospel to be at work in our hearts and in our lives. We need, you could say, the severe surgery of the Holy Spirit to make us new each day in our Lord and Savior. Pray, pray that the Spirit may work in us, work in us that radical repentance and conversion in our hearts, yes, and so also then in our lives, that each one of us in the power of the Holy Spirit Spirit may put to death, yes, all our impure acts and gestures and thoughts and words. And we need to put on the new life we have in Christ, one of pure acts and gestures, words and thoughts and desires. 
Yes, we can see, yes, sexual desire is a thing of great beauty. But in our lives, it needs the disciplining power of the Holy Spirit. May the Spirit then start, yes, by giving us a clean and new heart each day. So we, so we sang earlier in Psalm 51. For yes, daily we struggle. We struggle with sinful sexual lusts, yes, welling up in our hearts from within. Jesus knew of this struggle. That's why he warned about not just the outward acts of adultery and sexual immorality, but what was going on in our hearts. You can read that in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus calls us away from entertaining such sinful desires. And we do not go through life with a guilty conscience because of these sinful desires. No, Jesus Christ is Lord. In him we have abundant grace. There is forgiveness. With him we can have a clear conscience. In him we have the renewing work of the Holy Spirit. As the Lord Jesus also said, Blessed are the pure in heart. You read that in the Sermon on the Mount. Helpful verse in fighting lust and temptation to sexual immorality. We need to fight sinful desire with a pure and good desire in our heart. And our deepest desire needs to be for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the groom. Embrace him in, in complete trust. And so we, be single or married, are in Jesus Christ empowered by the Spirit to begin to live that pure and chaste life. And we can also in this way look forward then to the day of our Lord Jesus' return when our bodies will be completely transformed, when we will be completely perfected by the Spirit in our bodies, when we will indeed celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven, when we together as bride will be fully married to our groom, when we will live in deep and abiding love and joy with him and with each other forever. Amen.
and sisters in response to God's word, let us confess our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith. Let us do so with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess our faith in our triune God using the words of Kim Wai. <laughs> thank you for your great work, your work of creation, for making us in your image, for making us male and female. What beauty, what uniqueness. Yes, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Also with respect to our sexuality and gender, also with respect to sexual desire. We thank you, O oh Father, for the wonderful gift of, of marriage, of courtship. And Father, we pray that we may, in this way, live chaste and disciplined lives, as both within and outside of holy marriage, Father, you know the struggles, the sins, the failings that each and every one of us experience. You know the world in which we live, the temptations. And we pray that we may be strengthened in our bond with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That in him we may go forward that in him we may know of the complete forgiveness of all our sins and what we feel to be the most vile and terrible sins often connected with this command the seventh commandment cleanse us wash us clean in the blood of your son and grant us the renewing work of the spirit as may we indeed be temples of the holy spirit may the spirit dwell and work in us creating in us clean and new hearts, pure hearts, creating in us pure desires, sexual desires as well, helping us to live disciplined lives, sexually speaking, both within and outside of holy marriage. Father, we pray that you would be with us as parents as we seek to instruct our children in this respect, that we may have the courage to speak up and talk about this with them, and not just once, but continually as the otherwise will be taught by this world. Father, will you help us in this as parents? Be with our children, our teens, also as they grow up, as they physically and sexually mature, that in the midst of what can be sometimes confusing and difficult times, 
Let me be guided and led by your spirit. And that they may be directed also to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, may we all together continue then in the way of purity, of sanctification. Will you also bless then the bond of marriage in the midst of this congregation, that you would strengthen the relationships between husbands and wives, that this bond may, yes indeed, reflect the relationship between Christ and his church. You know, again, the struggles, the weaknesses, the shortcomings, and we pray again for the renewing work of your Holy Spirit, that there may indeed be a positive way forward when there is so much brokenness and weakness. And Father, will you also be with those in our midst who are single? If it is your will, will you bring them life partners? If it is not your will, will you give them peace and in their status in life, and that they may know of a deep relationship, as we may all may know of a deep relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's only in him that we can go forward each and every day. And Father, we ask that you would also be with those who are called to lead your people. You bless us as leadership of the church, as pastors and elders and deacons, that we may lead your people in your green pastures, that we may comfort and admonish, encourage. You know, the challenges we face in this work, will you give strength, will you give perseverance, give wisdom? Father, may we also as members be a hand and foot to one another, building one another up, and that we seek not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others, as we heard this morning. We pray that we'd also... Be submissive to those whom you have placed over us. Will you be with those who govern? And we pray that those who govern may reckon with your word and that they may be held accountable for their actions, for what they say, for what they do. Father, we live in disconcerting times and we pray that there may be a change of direction. Also, will you bless then the spread of the gospel in this world so many need to hear the good news. May we witness of the good news in our daily lives. Will you also bless those efforts to reach out as churches, body together. Bless the work of mission in Brazil. Think of our missionary Bram de Grappi with Bram and Celia and their family. Bless them in their work and service there in Brazil, amongst the churches there, and the communities there. Also closer by, will you... So bless the work of Streetlight Ministry, Reverend Paul Eastman, all those who assist him in this task. Uh, there too, there may be a blessing upon this work and that many more also in our city may come to faith in Jesus Christ. Father, will you also bless the instruction our children receive, blessing of reformed education, high school and elementary, and will you be with the teachers, and they may help us as parents in raising up the next generation. Bless all those who are busy with the good operation of the schools. So pray for the instruction that happens at the Theological Seminary, and the Teachers College, both places too. We pray for blessing on the professors and teachers, and also upon the students. Also, as they move towards the end of their semester, their tube may more be equipped for service in your kingdom, whether as, as missionaries or preachers, as teachers, instructors. Also be with our older teens and young adults and the instruction they received in various institutions of learning, often secular institutions. You give them wisdom, discernment, Again, as we said before, and these are challenging times, uh, they may indeed stand firm in their faith and they may even grow in their faith and witness to their faith and that they too may receive instruction for further service in your kingdom. And Father, will you continue to bless us in this day, bless us in our fellowship as we leave this auditorium. Will you also watch over us in the rest of this day, watch over us as we go into a new week, that we may be a blessing to all those around us. 
And will you hear us now in the forgiveness of all our sins in Jesus' name? Amen. You now have the opportunity to bring your gifts of gratitude to the Lord after the deacons have gathered these gifts. Let us sing our closing hymn. That would be hymn five, the stanzas three and four.